Hi, everybody. We started recording late, so we're halfway through the check-in, but the short version is look at the repo and see what's there. Um, and we're at the meeting up with your mentor to go over your LinkedIn. So once you're finished and you've got it where you want it, send that link to them. Um, they have a rubric. I don't know if you have access to that. But they have a rubric. You want to look at it and you'll see what they're looking for exactly. Um, so that's everything about your LinkedIn profile. And try and get that done as soon as you can, because what's coming up next week about interviews is going to take a lot of your brain space. Um, so Andrew's, so I'm backing up on the calendar here, Andrew's session on what to ask your interviewers. You're interviewing them too. That's key. You've got to get in that, that mental space of asking questions that matter to you. So Andrew's gonna to talk to you about how to figure out what matters to you, what's important. Um, and also, I'm sure Randy can talk about this, it impresses people when you ask good questions. You know, if you just ask, what's the salary? When do I start? You know, what's my job title? That, that's boring. But if you ask questions like, you know, what do you love about working here? Or what do you hate about working here? You know, whatever, whatever works for you, that's, that's going to lead to real conversations so they get to know you and you get to know them. Um, then it's going to be doing your tech take-home assignment. Um, if you get your LinkedIn done, I would start this before Saturday, even though it says to start working on it this weekend, um, because you want to have that done so that you can go through all the mock steps and there's multiple mock steps. You're going to make an appointment with uh, your partner. Where is that one? Pair interview practice. It says sync, but you're scheduling it. You can do it anytime you want. You're gonna meet up with that person and start practicing both the tech interview questions and behavioral questions. You'll wanna do that. And again, last pitch for if you haven't already done it, you have been assigned mentors for the technical mock and the job fit, get on their calendars, right? Just get on their calendars so that um, even if you're not ready yet, it'll be sometime next week and then you'll get ready. I think I hit everything, did I hit everything? That was beautiful. Okay, perfect. Cool. Let me perfect, get. Perfect, perfect. Great, well with that beautiful recap of where you're at again, doing LinkedIn now, submit LinkedIn to your mentors later this week. Um, we're opening the floor for questions, questions about refining your LinkedIn or what recruiters are looking for, how maybe you should position a, an experience that you had. What do y'all think is, has been going through the LinkedIn stuff been challenging, easy? Were you prepared already? Me think. Uh, hey everybody and uh, thanks Randy for doing this and uh, yeah it's been challenging of course uh, it's time consuming uh, but we can get there with your help and I have a couple of questions that I was wondering about uh, the first one is I have like some free food camp certificates and uh, I was wondering where I should put this certificate should I put them in education or certification or courses? Because like the three of those sections I was wondering about. And yeah, I can't remember my second question, which is done for me. Yeah, about the project sections. Yeah, about the project sections, should I like add all my projects or just the ones that I think they matter? So, um, okay. First, great question. Um, I think the, the first thing you have to really know about what us uh, sourcers and recruiters are looking for when we're looking at profiles is we're looking for, uh, usually we have a job with like set criteria that we're looking for and we're matching that against your profile, right? So what I would say is for, as long as it's on your profile, it can be in any of those sections. It's going to pull up in a search as long as those keywords are, are, are there, right? Um, what I would say is whatever makes the most sense for you. So if you have a lot of certifications and you're keeping them really well organized in that certification section, then I would put them there. Or if you want to have them, like whatever you think is not gonna make your profile sort of go crazy, right? Um, there, There's no, 
a hundred percent right way to do LinkedIn. It's social media and people use it differently. And that's across different cultures and, and things as well. But um, I would make sure that it's on there because you did it. And that's that needs to be talked about so that when we're looking for those skills, you can talk about them um, with the recruiter. The other piece of that, um, can you remind me what the second part of the question was? In the project about, section. Go yeah. Ahead. Should you put all of your projects or the projects you deem most uh, important? So that depends on how many projects you have and what those projects are, are, are right? If there's sort of smaller projects that, um, that maybe you don't think would be relevant to a lot of jobs, maybe they were just good for, for, for like learning. Um, you can have something brief about them. What I would say is whatever job you're interviewing for, make sure that there are projects that sort of speak to that role as well. And, and the reason for that is um, there, you can have as many projects on there as you want, but if your profile is getting too, like too big, uh, just because you're putting like all these smaller pro projects and, and things, it can sometimes be hard to find the pieces that we as the recruiters are looking for for that role, right? So what I like to do is I like to really uh, look at if I'm applying to a lot of jobs together, um, I'll, I'll look at like skills that are overall matching a lot of those different roles and make sure that I have projects speaking to those on my profile. Or um, I will always put any project I'm also really excited, uh, proud of, like, period. Like, yes, I don't want my profile to get too crazy or whatever, but if I feel proud about it, then that's always something that you want to be able to uh, advocate for yourself about. Like, um, and it also means you're going to have a lot more to talk about when you're in that interview section because you, you feel strongly about it, right? So that's what I would say. Anything you feel really, really proud of, put on there. Um, and projects that you think are relevant to the jobs you're applying for are the most important. And then after that, any projects that are sort of smaller pieces, you don't have to include, but if you want to, you can. It's your profile. <laughs> great questions and great responses, Randy. Other questions, other thoughts? Actually, I had a question. Something? Oh, sorry, Steph. Oh, it's okay. Um, do you want to go or do you want me to go? I'll go quick. This okay. came out of my meeting with my LinkedIn mentor to go over it. What she said was, you know, exactly what Randy said, something you're really proud of, something that matches. Um, but she also said you could make one of them your link to your GitHub. And it'll automatically pull over that. You'll have your face if you have a, of a picture on there. It'll say GitHub overview. So theoretically, you have a link right there to all of your projects anyway. You don't have to fill up that space with them. That's that's very true. If you have that GitHub, um, put it on your profile because uh, a good technical recruiter is going to go through some of it. Um, we may, and what I will say is depending on the technical recruiter, they may or may not have a technical background. Uh, we'll, we'll be honest, some companies don't. Um, some people like me start learning to code because I wanna be able to speak to, to engineers. Other people are, just like experts at the recruiting piece of that, right? But if you have that GitHub, that's always gonna go on to the hiring manager. They'll always be able to see your work. And that's what's really important, right? Is making sure that that work is getting seen by people who can understand it and can ask more in-depth questions about it. So thank you for sharing that, Shell. Um, Steph, I know you had a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've like watched videos and read articles and stuff about the like what you should put in your about me and I've edited it like 12 times and I still don't know if it's what's supposed to be in it basically <laughs> like what All are right. people looking for <laughs> <laughs> so so that's a that's a really good question and I think it's very different for a lot of people um I would say uh, what what exactly have you heard so far that way I can make sure I'm not like sort of rehashing things for you um, broad strokes is like, tell it in a story, mm -hmm. like tell your experience in a story. And then if you want to put your tech stack and put it at the bottom and that's yeah. basically what I've heard. <laughs> so, yeah, I will always be an advocate for putting your tech stack in there. 
if possible, because that's going to help uh, people find you, period. Um, but yeah, telling the story, telling the things that you're looking for in a role or like what brought you to whatever uh, field you're looking into is always really helpful. Um, I like to see that information more in the details of your roles than I do like in the about me section too much. Like I like to keep the about me section kind of succinct. Like I am a professional looking for this and these are the skills I have. I've seen people who have great, very long, well-built out about me's and that's totally fine too. Um, but what I will say is like, as long as you're talking about the things that are A, going to let someone know more about who you are as a candidate. That's important, right? B, why, especially for people who uh, are building skills and trying to get into that career, why, why do you want, what, what do you bring that's different than these people with these CS degrees? Because it's not as important as like some of us recruiters like to think it is. And I, I, I want to know what makes you special as a person. That's going to come across to me in a different way, right? Um, so anything that you think makes you unique. I think um, as a sorcerer, I, I do a lot of outreach to candidates. And I, I still remember like the candidates who in their about me section are, are talking about, hey, I'm an engineer and I'm coding all these things. And I love to do this, like love music or I love these things because that makes them so much more than, as you said earlier, Shelly, more than that robot, right? Like I'm, um, and as a person who has that background too, I was, uh, I remember my outreach to that person was like, hey, something about music, like something about songs. And we were, we were able to connect on that piece, which allowed us to sort of further that discussion. You never know what will speak to someone. Um, so I'd say trust yourself because the way you communicate is going to be different than the way I communicate, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, tell a little bit of that story, tell a little bit of what you're working with uh, as far as languages and skill set. Um, yeah, I, I think you can't go wrong with that. And then if going from there, having people look at it and tell you, hey, does this speak to you? Do you have any questions? Is there anything else you want to know? Thank you. Yep. Greta, you got another one? Uh, yes, uh, I have a quick note first, like uh, about what uh, Shelly said. Is this is the same what I did in the future section? I just put there my portfolio and my GitHub instead of listing all the projects there. So I guess that's good. I don't know. And the my my question is: I have now the education section is empty. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to have it empty? Because actually, I have a degree in marine mechanic, and I am like a career transitioning. Uh, but for some personal reasons, I don't want to put it there right now because, like, I don't know, that will automatically, like, put my LinkedIn, like, suggest my LinkedIn to the same people who went with me to the same faculty, and that will raise a lot of why you are doing this, and I don't want to deal with that right now. So, uh, just, is it okay right. that the vacation will be empty? <laughs> so, so, what I would say in your situation, from how you described it, I would say, if you don't want to put it, you don't have to put it. Like hands down, like at the end of the day, uh, you are the master of your profile. Now, what I will say is that there are people who do over fixate on education um, in, in, in especially in engineering fields. So you, if, if uh, I, I would recommend if down the line you think you want to put it, put, put uh, where you've studied coding for example, can also go in those, those sections um, instead. Uh, like having something there is better than nothing at all. But um, if you also don't feel like you want to have that there, you can have it and then have it on your resume or CV or, um, but yeah, it's, it. Here, here's the hard part, right? No, uh, Shelly, are you saying something? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Uh, no, basically, link. there are all of these resources that I know you guys are using as well and talking to people, but LinkedIn is, is different for a lot of people, and it's different for people across the world as well, right? Um, and people have reasons they don't want to put things, and that's fine. You as a human being are allowed to choose not to put something on your LinkedIn. 
Um, but be, care be, be ready to have maybe some consequences. Maybe some people don't look at your resume the same or your LinkedIn profile the same way. So um, that's a choice. But um, if possible, I put it because even if it is different from where you're trying to go, you can explain sort of the things that are leading you away from that original path and leading to your newer path. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Or anything, if you just want to know, like, what am I looking for when I'm looking at profiles? That's too kind too, right? Um, I, I've got a question. Um, the There's the skills section with the endorsements. Mm -hmm. um, is that a thing that people expect to see or don't expect to see? Um, like, I should love I be to see it if I can. Friends I love to see it if I can. Things? <laughs> so if possible, yes, it is. Uh, so do you have to? No. Uh, I've seen lots of profiles where people put like just the skills that they, they have and no one's endorsed them. And what that just means is that, hey, they're saying they're self-reporting that they have those skills. We need to vet them out in the interview process. The more people who you have endorse you gives the person looking at your profile a few more indicators that, hey, this person probably is uh has these skills and can use them um, readily. So for example, uh, I'm doing a lot of roles that are looking for Python engineers. If I see people with lots of Python sort of endorsements, I'm way more likely to say, hey, this person probably is actually using Python on a more regular basis and has that stronger skill set. So if possible, yes, I would do that. And the great thing is if you've worked with other people here in Collab Lab or in other little projects, you can have those people endorse you if they are seeing those skills, right? Um, that's that's what that is for. You can also do like LinkedIn certifications to like have that on your profile, which as a uh, sourcer and recruiter, I am also looking at. But if you just want to put them on there until you have people to endorse you, that's also okay. If you feel confident in them. I would not just put skills up there though. Uh, that you don't feel confident at. And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm saying that because I've, I've seen it. <laughs> but great question, thank you. I, I definitely have some questions along those lines um, as far as like what to include and what not to, because I, um, I have some experience with Ruby and a little bit with Python, but I really don't have any backend skills. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really focusing on front end, um, trying to get those front end engineering roles. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering if to, to even include Ruby or Python in my skill set or just leave it off. Yeah. So I've seen that. What I would do is make it very clear that you're more front end focused like either in the about me section or other places and talk about you have an interest in learning more about Ruby, like maybe, or maybe show some projects you've done with it. So that if there is a role that is more full stack, uh, but front end leaning, you'll also get pulled into those, um, those roles and those discussions. Um, it's okay to say, hey, I'm learning these, I'm learning these, or I have a small familiarity with these languages and these, uh, these things, these uh, frameworks, but like, make sure that it's clear because what is more frustrating um, as, because my job is 90% trying to make inferences off people's LinkedIn's, right? Like I go through and I look at what's written there. And if someone calls themselves a full stack engineer and then they don't really have that full stack, it can be really hard to try to advocate for that person <laughs> uh, with the hiring manager. So like, being clear that, hey, I'm more front end leaning, but I am learning these skill sets and interested in, in continuing that will always be uh, greatly appreciated and will help you in the long run. Randy, you said something that I really want to call out and I think is super duper mega important. I feel like somewhere down the line in like the job hunt space, recruiters and talent sourcers have kind of got this like reputation of like, oh, I guess salesmen kind of like, uh, but they're your friend. Like they're the ones you want to connect with. Cause like Randy said, they're the ones who are going to advocate for you. So if you can connect with recruiters and talent sourcers, that is gold. And not only for like the company that they're working for, but they know other people too. And they've worked at other places too. So if you can connect with them and build a good relationship with them, 
then that's like, that's your foot in the door. So if there is any kind of like stereotype in your head or just thoughts that you have around recruitment in general, try and shake that and think of them as your superpower because they're your advocate. I would also say like, when you have those conversations with recruiters, trust your gut because there are some recruiters. I will be honest. There are some recruiters out there who are more like sales manny and that's what they mm-hmm. worry about. I don't, I'm not that kind of person at all. <laughs> uh, and for me, when I'm looking at profiles, what I'm, the reason I enjoy recruiting and, and sourcing is because I love helping people get to where they want to go in their careers. Right. And, and so the entire thing is if we can meet and I can learn some, something about you and I'm like, Hey, this person isn't right for this role, but maybe down the road, this is another role that would work for them. Then I will always remember that person, write their, their name down and share that with the teams when, when the time comes. And there's so many recruiters out there like that. There's so many sources like that. Um, And what I would say is if there's a company that you really value and think about, even if it's not the right time, connect with that person, because who knows, maybe someday you, you will want to make that move. Yeah. And like an extension of this, this is something that I say, like in management, but also applies to the situation. It's like, make it easy for people to advocate for you. So when you're going into interviews, your job there is to make it easy for Randy to advocate for you. Give Randy everything necessary to turn around and say, this is why this person is great. It can feel weird to like talk about yourself and like your accomplishments, but that's literally why you're there. So don't hold back and like share as much like ammunition as you can so that they can take it back to somebody and be like, this person's amazing. I can tell you this just happened in, in hiring someone here, like, uh, someone I, I I love their profile they were doing really well on their test. They didn't have quite the number of years of experience. And so there was some back and forth like, hey, should we do this? And at the end of the day, I was fighting really hard and that person got hired. So I'm like, and, and because at the end of the day, that's what's important. If you have the skill set and you're doing these things and your recruiter is there to sort of, you know, really be that advocate for you in that process. That's why we have that initial screen and phone call, right? Um, so I love that. Can you think, Randy, of any situations where you heard, where you had a really good interview with a career changer? Because I feel like a lot of people from Collab Lab have experiences like working as like a t- high school teacher, for example, and it can be hard to figure out how to kind of position yourself for those first roles. What tips do you have in that space? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, very vague question. <laughs> you no, know, but I mean, very important because I think that is the hard thing. Um, and what I've seen is learning to communicate the skills that are transferable. It takes time. It takes work. But that's really what's going to help you stand out in those interviews. Right. So like if you were um, sort of doing some project management, for, for like your role, like you were taking on leading projects and sort of figuring out all the logistics and organizing all those things. That's a skill that you can talk about in so many different jobs outside of just what you were doing originally, right? So looking at what you've been doing and, and trying to think of it outside of the box of what, what that context was and how those, there are, there are always going to be some transferable skills. And um, like, learning to speak on that um, takes practice. So look and see if there were other people in your network who have also made that change, talking to them about how they're communicating it or looking at their profiles on LinkedIn and finding out the language that they're using is always really useful too. (laughs) Um, But like, yeah, I think it's that, it's that never feel like you have to have the perfect thing right now right? Like you can refine your page over time and you can figure out the better way to do it. The, the first thing is like to try, um, which I think is hard. Yeah. I think like one of the things that like worked for me as a career changer and that I've seen work for a lot of people and is a solid tip is to be really confident in what you have done. Like rather than going into an engineering interview and being like, 
well, I know I'm like, I don't have the experience that you're looking for. Like, ignore that. Be like, I want to be an engineer. I have this experience, but I also have an entire career of, you know, teaching where I did a lot of product project management and like really dig in and feel really confident about those transferable skills and don't dwell on what you don't have because that it just doesn't look good when you're interviewing somebody and they feel like really kind of like wobbly about it. And like, I'm not super confident. It's like, be really confident because you do have a lot of experience, maybe just not in this specific technology that they're working with. Right. And I think all of you here have an extra step in that you guys are actively seeking out these different relationships with other engineers and learning and working on projects together. That is something you can say till the cows come home, because mm -hmm. that's always going to be... Uh, <laughs> such a weird reference but yeah uh you, you can say that uh as much as you want because that's an indicator that you are serious about what you're this this career change and this shift and that's something that's going to speak to uh people who you are interviewing you hands down hmm. right if you all haven't like started i'm sure you have because you've heard me say this i'm sure a million times but your experience at the collab lab is legit working on a team of developers, like in the exact same way that we do at Zapier. It's like, you're using the same processes, you're communicating in the same ways, you're experiencing the same struggles. And so talk about it like it was the job that you had, like sure you didn't get paid, but nobody needs to know that. Just say, this was a team that I worked on to build an app. And then there's all your stories that you need. So really lean into that. Yeah, and I'd say the same thing if there are uh, individual projects that you're doing, like, hey, I decided to build out this, little side app, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, that's awesome. Exactly. Like, tell me about it. I want to know about those things because I want to see what you're doing. Um, even if you're not um, doing it for a, a quote, quote job, like, what are you passionate about? What are the things that motivate you as a worker? So, yeah. And if you can take those side projects, even that you did individually and almost like add some project management to it and talk about like, this was my MVP. This was the main thing I wanted to get done. Here's what I want to do next, because I think it could be really helpful to have this for X, Y, Z reason. I think this is how I might technically implement that. But if you can show that you're not just like, you know, throwing together things willy nilly, but you're thinking intentionally about the process, that's like really powerful and is a big part of what engineers do on the job. Perfect. Uh, I have another question then. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a general question, like what makes you like, what is some small things that makes you choose some candidates over others? Or, mm -hmm. yep. So my job is never to choose the final person that that's the that that's the important thing i think to realize is that i'm working with a team of hiring managers uh typically or uh with like other people in that department to help them find the right person but when i'm looking at a profile and i'm i have 10 or 12 profiles in front of me and i'm trying to decide which of these profiles to sort of reach out to the first thing is whether or not they match my skill set it's it at the end of the day if I could love everything about this profile here, but if they don't have Python, I, I, I can't reach out to them, right? Um, not, not at least for that role, right? Uh, if that's what the team is looking for. So making sure that whatever skills you, you have are on your profile and that they're, they're there so that they can clearly be pulled up, right? Because what we're doing is we're using Boolean and pulling together keywords. That's the basic part of it, right? Uh, so as many like important things, uh, keywords that you can find. And um, if there are sort of, as you guys continue in your career, like domains that within engineering that you start gravitating towards, like maybe over time you start working more in like security roles, make sure to put like security type of keywords in your profile. Those are what I'm pulling up. And the more I see it, validators that this person has a skill set that matches my job description that's where i'm making that that sort of decision to reach out solid question i can speak to that a little bit too from the like hiring manager standpoint like because this is like again first week of collab lab we're really figuring out how to get you the interview 
And then second week of Collab Lab, it's like nailing the interview. So we'll dig more into this next week too. Um, but one thing that I always look for is one, the people have actual stories. So like, it doesn't hold a lot, like people can bullshit all day long. They can like fill you with what they would do and what they could do, but I wanna hear what you have done. And so if you come into an interview and somebody asks me a question, tell me about a time you had a conflict on a team. And you're like, well, you know, there's a lot of conflicts on team, like say me and somebody didn't agree. This is what I would do. It's like, yeah, okay, I can say that too. But what I wanna hear is an actual story about there was this one time we were working on this project, like following the star method, which I'm sure y'all have heard about. If not, I'll send it. But like, give me an actual story. And I always want that story at the end to have an upside. So even if it was like this conflict you had where things were bad, even at the end of it's like, next time I think what I would do better, like to improve the situation or whatever it might be, I would do this. Or like, yeah, this didn't work out as planned, but we learned this. Like if you can take whatever that situation was and add kind of like an upswing to it at the end, I always love to see that. Cause I'm like, this person's really optimistic and is eager to grow. Like is eager to see everything as a learning opportunity rather than just be like, yeah, we didn't get along. We didn't agree on this situation. And we ended up going with their idea. But yeah. when we were in the numbers, their idea was really good. You know, like take mm -hmm. it up at the end if you can. Yeah, what, what I'll say um, when I hear those kinds of stories that I'm also thinking of is that you're thinking critically about what's happening around you rather than being reactive. You, you are like trying to learn and grow and continue to develop as a person. And that's gonna tell me more about your potential to continue to grow in the future than mm -hmm. the sort of hypothetical, well, this is what I could yeah. or would have done, right? Yeah. I you. get real weird too about like, people being negative on interviews like obviously you're going to talk about negative situations but like try and find a way to be really empathetic about the situation and the people involved and like I don't know optimistic about it in a way because if I hear people being negative I'm like I don't want them on my team if they're ne negative and so that's something I personally look for I don't think everybody does I think there's lots of people that would interview you and be like yeah that was a shit situation I'm glad you told me about it thank you next whereas I'm like Oh, well, tell me about how everything was okay, though. Make it okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's also, um, and, and I heard you say this when you were talking about sort of the interview process, and, and, and it's true. You are also interviewing the people who you're talking to and make sure that, like, how they react to those situations sort of is okay with how you think you want to work on a team. Like, if you're future potential hiring manager is someone who's sort of like really critical of everything that's happening in your story you might want to think about like is this the kind of place I would want to work right mm -hmm. Where, whereas like if it's someone who's trying to sort of talk through like okay so how did we how did you solve this and and these kinds of things like that's telling you that they're they're trying to help people understand those outcomes and and how things can change and that'll be really interesting. Uh, at least that's what I think is interesting for mm -hmm. team. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Other thoughts? Questions about how to get the interview or what to do once you're in it. Mm -hmm. Or what talent sourcers and recruiters are doing. In the past, we've asked, like people have asked some questions and I don't know what this technology is called, but you know, the ones that like scrape LinkedIn and mm -hmm. like return new people. Are there, do you have any tips or like experience working with those and how people can sort of gain those a little bit? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, is, is keywords. <laughs> like, it, it, like a lot of what, um, what people are pulling from, from profiles most times are, are keywords for things. So uh, for example, a anything that you think uh, p you're hearing a lot in, in, in your conversations with other developers uh, for like things that their, their companies can be become keywords in a lot of ways. So for example, uh, I'm doing a security role right now. One of those words is uh, like, you know, bug bounties like doing bug bounties, like mm -hmm. figuring out how they're solving and finding these bugs. And like, they're looking for people who are actively like going out and, and trying to squash bugs for, for, for people. If, that, if a person has something like that on their profile, it's telling me that they're doing that. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a potential keyword for, for uh, that security role, for example. 
Um, other things are any conferences, any, um, yeah, I, I would say like, so what I've seen that makes me the, the hardest to find people to advocate for is like when I see a profile and it's blank and it's literally just like their role and where they are. And it's usually an engineer who's not like typically wanting outreach, which is fine. Um, but if, if you are actively trying to get found in, in, for jobs or you want to like recruiters to reach out to you, put as much information as you can about the things you've worked on, about the things that you're uh, proud of, um, the projects that you've been a part of, your GitHub. Um, make sure that you have those things and they're called out clearly, um, either in title or like, I did this or I use these frameworks and these languages. Those words and languages are going to pull into uh, a scraper and you want to make sure that they're there. Yeah. Scrapers are hard. Uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, we we get a lot of our emails from like uh, random places. So check your emails and sometimes check your spam, but don't just go answer spam. Don't click on spam stuff. But like look out because we do send a lot of uh, emails randomly and sometimes they don't go to the right place. <laughs> it, it does happen. Like I've, I've sent... So one of the things that a good recruiter will do is send more than one outreach message. Like bad recruiters sort of uh, spam messages widely. Mm -hmm. um, a good recruiter is typically going to actually read what's on your profile. Um, and so I would, I would vet who's reaching out to me through that. Like if the person is able to reach out and say something about like what I've actually written, that's telling me they've read through it, they've actually looked at who I am, I'm way more likely to engage with them. Um, yeah. Oh, hey, Steph. What's up? Hey, kind of on that note, um, I've had recruiters reach out to me, but they're very vague. Mm -hmm. They're like, I read your profile. I have, I might have something for you. Let me know. And I like, don't know what to do with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that is a hundred percent fair. And I would say, uh, if you are in a place where you want to talk to a recruiter and get more information, you can. You don't have to, especially right now with the way the market is. There's going to be more recruiters reaching out to you. Are they? You, <laughs> I mean, are, do I do. Is that what I should be? You can. Expecting? You can ask more questions. You can always okay. ask. More. Uh, <laughs> okay. I would always ask uh, the things that are important. If uh, hey, compensation is uh, and transparency around that is really important to you, which. Surprise, it's it's totally fine for it to be. Feel free to ask. Like I've done it when re recruiters reach out to me now. I'm like, hey, great. I already have a great role. I'm not really looking, but uh, tell me about compensation, your ideas on remote and this, right? And either they tell me, hey, this is what it is. And I say, you know, not right for me or okay, let's have a call. You, you can always ask more. And if they don't want to answer, I would sort of end there typically. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Randy, around, <clears throat> so like, I remember whenever I was trying to get my first engineering role, I was like, there are 50 roles that people are trying to give me that I could take, but they don't seem like really good fits, but I was really torn between like, is it worth it to go do like a not so great role for three months even to like just be looking as I go for the next best thing so that I'm getting like that more official experience. Do you think it's weird if somebody's like has three months and then moves on in this day and age? Because I know things have shifted quite a bit or is, is that better? There is some shifting right now. Um, it, it's hard because I think this is also viewed differently by different hiring managers. Um, mm -hmm. Like I've had people who don't want to see people who have moved around much in the last three, four or five months um, with a lot of people changing their jobs during the great resignation that's happened over the past few months, that's gotten better and people are more open to it. Um, what I would say is um, if you feel like you want to be working in that field and you want to do that, and even if it's not a perfect job that it would be beneficial for you to work there, do it like follow what your heart says but don't do it at the detriment of like being able to like you know continue to grow and develop like if that place stunts your growth that's also not healthy and not not good for you um 
I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, we live in a world where sometimes we have to take that job, right? I, I'd be, if I were thinking about making that move, I would make it very clear when I'm interviewing with people and talking to people that that's why I took that job. Like, hey, yeah, I, like I was only here three months. This is why I'm looking at leaving. This is why um, this might not have been the perfect role, but this is what I learned from it. And this is what um, was really valuable about this experience for me. Yeah, that, that upswing. <laughs> I love that. Uh, exactly what I'm looking for every time. Yeah. Uh, if, if you, yeah, if you can make something into a positive, it's always great. Uh, I see a question here in chat. Um, how do recruiters work? I've been approached by recruiters before and their LinkedIn profile would say they work for, or they're employed for X company, but they were approaching me for a different company. What's the recruiter's relationship to that other company? Great question. Um, there's a lot of different relationships that recruiters can have with companies. Um, for example, what I am, I'm an in-house sourcer recruiter. So I work for Zapier and only do Zapier roles, right? So uh, some recruiters are like that, where they work for a company and they're reaching out on behalf of the same company they're working for. Unfortunately, the other thing that typically happens is I work for company A and we are contracting with company B to find employees for them. So uh, when I worked at this place called Mindlance, uh, we were putting employees for, for their Apple team, right? So I would reach out to people and say, hey, you will be a employee with us, but you'll be working at Apple. Um, that's, if that's the type of work, if you're looking at contract roles or something like that, that can be a foot in the door. But I would be very cautious because contract roles have very different uh, like benefits and, and those kinds of things like, uh, like time off and, and things like that. Um, I would talk, if a recruiter reaches out to me and there is some ambiguity as to whether or not they work for X company or not, I would always ask, say, hey, uh, I'm seeing this on your profile. Um, can you tell me what, what this role is? Would I be a full employee of this company or that company? Um, and they have to tell you. If they don't tell you, run away, <laughs> right? Like th there are some weird places out there, but like most places will be very upfront if you ask that question. And it's totally fine to ask that. You are 100% in your right to ask it. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, there, there's just a lot of different relationships you can have. Uh, the other thing you might see is uh, I worked for an executive tech recruiting firm and we, were, we weren't doing uh, contract roles at all. We were like very specifically looking for a very niche profile and giving that to like for exact profiles. And as you get farther in your career, that could be the type of recruiters who reach out to you too. There's just so many different things that I would just ask for clarification when you get those outreach and it's unclear. Are there any ways that you think are like acceptable or exciting that engineers can reach out to recruiters? Like I see yeah. a lot of engineers reaching out to other engineers who refer them and stuff. But I'm almost like, would you get a wider spread reaching out to recruiters? Yeah, so I would look for recruiters who are posting things on the types of roles that you're looking for. So you can look through LinkedIn and look for posts that are looking for like, like any, well, one I think is just keeping an eye out to see what kinds of places are, are posting, right? You can follow companies that you're really excited about and see when those companies post things. If you're seeing a recruiter at a company you're really excited about saying, hey, I'm looking for, you know, engineers for this team, maybe a front end engineer to work on this type of project, and that project sounds perfect to you, 100% reach out to that recruiter, introduce yourself, and share your, your information. Um, and, and tell them, hey, I've been a fan of the company. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. Would you have time to, to connect, right? The worst thing that can happen is that, hey, unfortunately this role is closing right now. That, that does happen. But remember that companies hire in cycles. It's never just, hey, I'm hiring this one role and we're never looking at that role ever again. So even if it's not perfect uh, timing, that connection and being connected with that person on LinkedIn can then potentially, you'll see posts that their connections are posting and maybe they'll have a role that makes more sense. So. Um, I would reach out, say hello, and, and you can be very clear. Hey, I saw your post and it really resonated with me. I'd love to like 
talk a little bit about this. I've had conversations with people who are like, uh, hey, Zapier seems like a great place. Let's, uh, I'd love to learn more. And even if it's not for a specific role, you can start building the, those uh, connections with recruiters and sourcers. Right. I think that it's really exciting to reach out to people. It's a really good idea to reach out to people because if you were to just go apply at Zapier, like we get so many applicants, there is a very slim chance that you're actually even going to get like, yeah. there are so many, there's so many. And you can really let your personality shine through a lot better. I feel like if you reach out to somebody, make a connection with somebody rather than. And what that means is I have, if I talk to somebody and they sound great, I'm going to be really excited and run to the nearest hiring manager and be like, yo, I just had this awesome conversation. Check out this profile. And even if it's not like 100% spot on, I can advocate for you. And, and that's where those conversations uh, can be really important. Exactly that. I love it. Other questions? I feel like recruiters and talent sourcers too are, it's like more comfortable almost to reach out to them because there's less of that like imposter syndrome that you're talking to like an engineering manager or senior level engineer. You're like, oh, I'm talking to somebody who talks to candidates all day. Like this is a lot less pressure than somebody who's going to be like, tell me about recursive, you know, like some technical thing true. that you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say like, um, the, the one thing I have seen is that the sort of opposite of that, as people get sort of later stage in their career, they start looking at recruiters as like, oh, you know, they don't know what, what they're talking about. They don't know like the technical pieces of this. And, and, um, and sometimes that is true. Sometimes <laughs> us recruiters don't have that knowledge. We didn't put in that work. But uh, I've seen people in recruiting who have come from all different backgrounds, including former uh, like tech engineers. So always check always see what uh, their profile is because I, I've seen it where people have gone into an interview and talked to somebody who is very technical as if they weren't technical and that can mm. leave a, a weird taste in that recruiter's mouth too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even today, I like, like I have connections with recruiters too, even today, because if you connect with a hiring manager or an engineer, they're going to be really excited about you for a minute when they have a role open. And when they no longer have a role open, that's basically closed. Like they don't have the time and energy to like think about you anymore because they need to go do their job. But like, mm -hmm. if you connect with recruiters and keep in recruiters, you know, in boxes and stuff, then it's like, those people are there for you. Like their job is to advocate for you. So it's like, to never neglect the recruiter community. Yeah, I like, I like that. <laughs> but uh, what I will say is like, yeah, even if it's just, hey, I, because maybe when I reach out to you or someone reaches out to you, it's not the right time. You can say that, hey, I'm not looking right now, but I will be in six months. Can we reconnect then? And put a calendar invite thing on your calendar to be like, hey, send this person a message. I know I do it as a recruiter, but I'm always really excited when someone who says that they want to talk in a few months with messages back, because then I'm like, oh, they were really serious. Let's let's get them in process as soon as possible, right? Um, yeah. So it's like a shortcut. It's like a sh shortcut into their pipeline because if not, then you just oh, get sure. like if you apply, you get added to this huge stack that. Job yeah, I mean, if, they even look at you. if us recruiters and sourcers put in profiles, we, I mean, we're definitely more likely to want to look at those profiles and to move them forward faster in some ways. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean you won't ever get seen if you just apply to places. So do that as well. But, um, but yeah, we, we definitely will go, oh yeah, no, I want to move this person forward. Let's move. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay, couple more minutes. Any other questions? Yeah. And if not, Nikki, I love your cat in the background. I'm a very big cat <laughs> person. My cat is sleeping on the windowsill over there. Aww, window cat. Yeah, I had to share. <laughs> I love that. Well, cool. Okay, we can call this one. If anybody has any questions, just post them. We'll find answers to you. We'll send them to Randy or we'll figure it out. We have answers to questions, so ask all the questions. Um, as Shelly mentioned, you can also be doing the um, 
how to tell your story session, watching through that, and just continuing to refine your LinkedIn's and send them to the mentor you're signed with um, by the end of the week so they can get those reviewed. And we'll keep posting updates and announcements about where you should be in the progress on the process. So thank you, Randy. Thank you everybody for coming and asking good questions. We are here for you. We're all in this together. So let us know how we can help. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye, friends. Good to see you all. Bye.